Hello, welcome back to Piers Rocks. Last time around, we developed an embassy application for three out of four of the supported hardware platforms. Today, AliExpress have come through, so we're going to develop a Nordic embassy application. So the Nordic microcontroller I have on these development boards are the NRF52840. The NRF range of microcontrollers are designed for low footprint, low power applications, particularly those involving wireless protocols. So this particular chip supports Bluetooth LE, Zigbee and a number of other protocols. Some of the other range of chips support cellular protocols. These are all ARM Cortex based microcontrollers. What we're going to do today is we're going to literally start from scratch from a blank slate and develop a very simple application using Rust and Embassy for this Nordic chip. So let's get started. So if you're following this video as a tutorial, I'm assuming that you already have Rust installed and you already have Probe RS installed. Probe RS is a Rust based embedded device programming and debugging tool which we're going to use to flash the Nordic device and to view the logs from it once we have our basic application put together. So the first thing we need to do is we need to create ourselves a new project which in Rust we do with Cargo New and we'll call this project NRF. So we now have an NRF directory and it's created us a cargo.toml and a source directory and in the source directory we'll have main.rs. First thing we'll go and do is we'll go and write our application in main.rs. So I've opened it up. You can see Cargo's pre-populated it with a hello world uh, main function. We don't need that, so we'll get rid of it. And the first thing we need to do is we need to indicate to the compiler that this is a no stud application, so it doesn't use the standard library because we're developing an embedded application. We also want no main because we're going to use a special embassy main macro to define our main function. We then need to use a few things. We need to use the spawner from Embassy Executor. We're going to, in this application, we're just going to turn a, an LED on and off and cycle through doing that. So we need to use some of the Embassy NRF GPIO objects. We're going to need level, output, and output drive to create our GPIO object. We're going to need a timer, so we're going to use embassy time timer. And then we need a um, panic handler. Basically, there's a little bit of magic here that allows you to compile your embedded application to work with probe RS. So that is the use statement we need. And then we're going to use dformat for its logging capabilities, and I'm just going to use an info log in this application. So that's all the preamble we need in our application. We can now define our embassy main function. So we need embassy executor main, and then we define our asynchronous main function. And embassy will pass us a spawner object to allow us to spawn different tasks. For this initial implementation, we're not going to be spawning any separate tasks, so we're not going to use spawner. And first thing we need to do with any embassy application on any platform is initialize the hardware. So we do that with embassy NRF init, and we just use the default configuration to initialize the board. So that's now initialized embassy. And now we want an LED object. So we create ourselves a new output pin and we pass in the appropriate hardware peripheral for the GPIO that's connected to the onboard LED. On my boards, I know that's um, pin 015. So that's the pin I'm going to use here. I'm going to create it with a low level to start with. So this particular board, the low is the LED off and high is the LED on. And then we also need to pass in the output drive strength we want for this pin and we'll pass in standard drive strength. We'll just make a log at this point. 
indicate that our application has uh, is starting up. And now we'll create ourselves an infinite loop, which will go round and round and round, turning the LED on and off. So we want to set the LED high to begin with. We'll then wait half a second, so after millis 500. And because this is a, a, an asynchronous function recording, we need to await it. And then we set it low. And then we wait again. And that should be it. We'll see in a moment once we've set up our cargo.toml and another file and installed the target for the Nordic devices just how many compile errors I've managed to fit into a 22 line program. Then the next thing we need to do is we need to edit our cargo.toml file, which I've got up here in a separate window. And we need to basically point the compiler at all the libraries that we need to use in this application. So I'm going to cheat by uh, copying these dependencies in from another application I have. So this is a very standard list of embassy libraries being included. And I don't actually need all of these in my application, but it'll make it easier to add additional functionality to this, to this application later. And there's a few more I need as well. I need um, deformat and some Cortex-M crates and panic probe. Now, this is a thing that I learnt uh, after a little bit of playing with Embassy. There is There are versions of the various Embassy crates on crates.io. However, they are not very up to date. And I, for example, found problems when trying to use Embassy with the Pico 2, which is the more up to date version of the Raspberry Pi Pico. And what I needed to do was actually pull in patched versions of Embassy directly from GitHub. So I'm going to do that now in my cargo.toml. So what I'm doing here is I'm pointing cargo at the GitHub repo for all of the embassy crates and also giving it a Git revision so that it can look at a particular point in time of the GitHub history, which I happen to know is a, a good point in time because I've used it for other applications. And that should do us for this initial application. That's all we need in our cargo.toml. Now there's one other file that we don't actually need to create, but it makes it easier to compile and to flash the example application if we create. So we make ourselves a .cargo directory and then we create a config.toml in that cargo directory. So what we provide in the cargo config.toml file is some additional project specific configuration to cargo. The first thing we're going to do is tell it when cargo run is executed, what we will actually want to happen. So in this case, we want probe-rs to be run. And what this will do is it will flash our Nordic device with the image that we created as part of the cargo build step. The next thing we want to do is tell cargo what target to use by default when we run cargo build. And for the Nordic devices, we need to use the thumb v7em none eabi target. And we'll need to install that target and we'll do that in a second. And then finally, we'll provide some configuration to deformat, which is the logging tool that we're using here. And here we're just saying we want all logs from trace level upwards. In fact, we only have one trace statement, uh, one, one log statement. That's an info log. But if we had other types of logging, that would all also be produced due to this configuration. So we'll write that. And we now have the three files that we need to compile and run our projects. So the next thing we'll do is we'll compile it. So in fact, the next thing we need to do is we need to install support for this specific thumb v7em target on this machine. I don't have that target installed yet. But to do that, we do rust up target install and then the name of the target, which I'm pretty sure was this. So rust up will download all the necessary gubbins and then we'll be able to compile our program. Right, so that's now done. So we can do a cargo build and see how many compile errors I have in my very simple application. No compile errors. So that was 
slightly unexpected, but then I was copying my application from another screen, which has compiled successfully. So kind of should have worked. Anyway, next thing we need to do is flash our device with this application. Before we do that, the way we're going to be flashing this application is we're going to use a debug probe. So I have a Raspberry Pi branded debug probe here that I'm going to use to flash this application. And this uses SWD to communicate with the device under test. And all of the Raspberry Pi Pico Pico 2, STM32 and Nordic chips support SWD out of the box. However, the Nordic device, I don't think exposes the two SWD pins, the digital input output and the clock pin via the regular pin header. Instead, there's a number of gold pads on the bottom of the circuit board. So what I've done is I've soldered a couple of wires to those pads to the IO and the clock lines and also connected the debug probe to those but also to the ground pin of the device. So now that's connected I should be able to flash the device. So I've plugged in the debug probe and I've also plugged in the Nordic device at the same time and we can see that we have detected, this is my debug probe, it's detected. As well as the SWD mechanism for programming and detecting logs from the device, the Nordic devices, like the Raspberry Pi Pico, have a built-in USB bootloader. So if you plug them in via USB, presumably holding down the onboard button, they'll boot into a special bootloader mode and allow you to mount them as a file system on your device and copy a UF2 file over to the device and that will cause it to be programmed. As I say, we're going to use the debug probe to program it here directly using Cargo. So let's now try flashing the device using ProbeRS. And we can see we get a, a warning and nothing got flashed to the device. And the warning says that no loadable segments were found in the ELF file. That's because I've skipped one absolutely crucial step when building a embedded application using Embassy and Rust. And that's that we need to tell the compiler how it should actually build the ELF file. So let's take a look at that now. So there are two critical files we need at this point. We need a memory.x file, which tells the linker how to produce the ELF file. And then we also need a build.rs file. And the build.rs file is going to put the memory.x file in a location that the linker can find it at build time. So the easiest way to produce these files is to copy them from an embassy example for your particular hardware. It needs to be for your exact type of board because it contains information about the uh, addresses that the chip is going to look for a program at and how big the RAM is and so on. So I'll copy these two files over and then we'll take a very quick look at each of them. So this is the memory.x file. It's very straightforward, it just tells the linker where the flash is and where the RAM is for this device and how big they both are. The build.rs file is putting the memory.x file in the out directory so the linker can find it from there. It's also providing a bunch of configuration to the Rust compiler, the link stage, of the various link arguments to use when linking everything together. So these two things are required to pro produce an ELF file which actually has your code within it. So if I rerun cargo build at this point, hopefully when we now run cargo run, it will not complain about there being no code here and it will actually flash the device. So it is flashing the device this time around and we see the log that we expect to see saying that the device is starting and then I'll show you the device. So there are two LEDs on this device and I apologize for the fact it's not in focus. The blue light is not controlled by me that constantly flashes on this particular board. The red light on the other side of the board that is blinking on and off is the one that's being controlled by GPIO 15. So our simple starter application has worked. 
So what did that take? Five minutes, less than five minutes to get started with the NRF 52840 board using Embassy and Rust. Now, the second thing I wanted to look at in this video was um, revisiting the task watchdog that we looked at last time. So task watchdog is a crate that I've written to be compatible with Rust and all the devices that Embassy supports, the Pico and Pico 2, the STM32, the ESP32, and now the Nordic devices. And it provides an abstraction on top of the various hardware specific watchdog implementations of these different devices and extends the watchdog functionality to be task aware. Just to recap, watchdogs in hardware devices, pretty much all microcontrollers have hardware watchdogs built in. These are essentially timers that when you start them, they automatically tick down and when it hits zero, they reboot the device. Unless you feed or pet the watchdog by making a particular function call. That will reset the timer and it will start counting down again. It's essentially a way for your application to indicate to the hardware that it's still alive, it's still doing something. And if that doesn't happen, if it doesn't indicate that it's still alive and doing something, the hardware watchdog will reboot the device to try and recover it. What I've done with task watchdog is I've made it task aware so that any task that you register with the task watchdog has to periodically feed the task watchdog and only if all tasks feed it regularly will it feed the hardware watchdog. That's not a capability that most of these hardware devices provide natively. Now I have some Nordic devices, I've extended my task, task watchdog implementation to support all four hardware devices that the Embassy framework supports. And I just want to qu quickly show you the Nordic specific code in my task watchdog sample application. Essentially this application has four tasks. It has a main task, a sensor task, a network task and a failing task. They all get started. They all feed the task watchdog periodically but then after 15 seconds the failing task will stop feeding the task watchdog. After five seconds the task watchdog will notice that the failing task has stopped feeding it and it will stop feeding the hardware watchdog and then after another five seconds the, the hardware watchdog will notice that it's not been fed and it will reboot the device. So this is one, one application that supports all those four different hardware platforms, the Pico and Pico 2, the ESP32, the STM32 and now the Nordic devices. So the first thing we do is we initialize the hardware like we just did in our very simple example. We do some logging stuff. We then Briefly flash the LED attached to pin 015 to let the user know that the device has booted. And then we create the watchdog configuration and we create the task watchdog itself. And then we register all of our tasks and we spawn those tasks and off we go. So let's see this application working on the Nordic device. We can just run the flash async NRF52840 shell script. So this is now flashing the device and it started running and all the different tasks are busy feeding the watchdog. As I said, after 15 seconds, the failing task will stop feeding the watchdog and it will actually log to say it stopped feeding the watchdog. So that it just logged a warning log. After 20 seconds, task watchdog notices that. We see some errors because it's noticed, it, noticed that and then the device reboots. So I hope you enjoyed this quick, short, sharp, to the point video about getting started with the Nordic NRF52840 chip and Embassy and Rust. It really is that simple. Within about 15 minutes of me taking this out of the bag, I had these SWD leads soldered to it and I had my Blinky application programmed to it and running successfully. The only thing you need other than the device and a couple of leads is a debug probe of your choosing. This is a dedicated Raspberry Pi Pico debug probe, works fine with the Nordic device. If you don't have or want to spend the £11, presumably 11 to $15 on one of these, then you can actually use a stock Raspberry Pi Pico for three or four pounds, three or four dollars, and use that as a debug probe to program your Nordic device. If you did enjoy this video, you found it useful and interesting, please do stick around. Till next time, rock on.